For the record, uh, my name is Tania Finansh Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the Chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity channel 8, RCN channel 82, and files channel 964. The council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways, attend one of the hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony was on April 26 at 6 p.m. and the following at, on June 2nd at 6 p.m. virtually. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtual via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can give you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm@boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation for or residence and limit your comments to two minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Email your written testimony to the committee at cccwm at boston.gov. Submit a two minute video or testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the city council budget process and how to testify, please visit the city council's budget website at boston.gov for slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on dockets 0480 to 0482, orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, for the school department, and for other post-employment benefits, OPEB. Docket 0483, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations, docket 04 84 to 0486 orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Dockets 0492, order for BCYF revolving fund. Our focus area for this hearing will be Boston Centers for Youth and Families, BCYF, including BCYF revolving funds. Our panelists for today's hearing are Chief of Health and Human Services, Jose Maso. Is it Maso? Thank you. Martha Rivera, Interim Commissioner, BCYF. Edward McGuire, Director of Operations, BCYF. Barbara Pecci, Director of Administration and Finance, BCYF. I am joined today by my counselor colleagues, Councillor. Aaron Murphy at large, Councillor Liz Braden, District 9, Councillor Frank Baker, District 3. Councillor Mejia submitted um, a letter in her absence, which I will read into record um, at this time. Uh, Councillor Mejia has questions, and I can read them into record uh, at the time for questioning. Uh, Dear Madam Chair and members of Ways and Means, I am writing to inform you of my absence during today's City Council hearing on docket 0480204860492 FY23 budget, Boston Centers for Children and Families, BCYF revolving funds. A representative from my staff will be listening in and following up with me. I look forward to reviewing the footage and following up as need be. I am submitting the following questions to be entered into the record with the hopes of getting a response from the administration either during or after the hearings. Sincerely, Julia Mejia. 
Um, once again, I will read um, Council Mejia's questions uh, upon the time that we are doing so. Um, I thank you everyone for being here today for your work um, and your commitment to um, uh, Boston youth and families. Um, we thank you ahead of time for your presentation and putting that together. Um, the BCYF offers many services and resources to youth and their families throughout the city. I'm interested in delving deeper into the particulars of the general truth, um, how your budget is allocated, who makes those decisions, um, and how we can help you to ensure that we are doing what we can do to make sure that you feel supported. Um, so in the spirit of cooperation and collaboration, let's begin. For our format, or at least the format that I use here, um, and before I go on, I'd like to recognize that Councillor, we've been joined by our colleague, Councillor Kenzie Bach, District 8. Um, for our format, or at least the format that I've chosen um, for these hearings, you will have a total of 15 to 20 minutes to present. Uh, then we'll go to round one of questioning where the counselors will monitor their time, a total of eight minutes each, um, and it's on them to either pause or ask to uh, speed up um, your responses. And then we'll go to public testimony. Each uh, person will have two minutes to give their public testimony, then a second round, um, and then usually just closing statements after that. If we feel that uh, there's not enough time or we need to converse further, then we will bring you back for another hearing. Possibly, I doubt it, but um, hopefully we're gonna be wrapping up today. All right, and now I'll turn to the floor to administration for their presentation. Um, welcome, before you speak, please uh, state your name and um, position for the record, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm actually going to turn, I think, our sure. team is going to start. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Jose Maso. I am the Chief of Human Services. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair fernandez Anderson. It's a pleasure to be here. And the distinguished members of the Council, Council Murphy, Council Baker, Council Breeden, and Council Bach, uh, when she returns. Uh, my name, as I mentioned, is Jose Maso. Um, and I'm new to the role of Chief of Human Services. I'm um, joined today by BCYF Interim Commissioner Marta Rivera, Director of Operations Eddie McGuire, Director of Administration and Finance Barbara Pecci. And I will happily turn the mic over to Commissioner Rivera and her team in a couple of minutes. But first, I wanted to take a moment to quickly introduce myself and say how happy I am to be here today to support all the great work that's being done by the Human Services Cabinet. As you may know, I was born and raised in Boston, educated in the Boston Public School System, and a proud graduate of Boston Land Academy. I was born and raised in High Park, and I now reside there in High Park and raise my two children in the city as well. Uh, I'm also a proud product of BCYF, first as a lifeguard, uh, where I was able to foster my, um, my passion for youth development, and then as a street worker, and recognizing the importance of being able to support families and the great work that BCYF does. Uh, so I bring a lot of personal experience and personal history to this new role. In short, I have uh, three short-term goals for this cabinet. First, I want to support our departments as they engage in a safe and equitable recovery and reactivate our city spaces, our libraries, our community centers, our senior centers, so residents can reconnect with the neighbors and re-engage with the community. Second, I am committed to listening and learning. I will be visiting all of our sites in the first 100 days and taking the time to listen to staff and residents about what's going well in our departments and what needs to be addressed. I strongly believe that the people doing the work and residents act assessing the services can offer some of the best insights into how we can do better. Finally, and this is not subject of today's hearing, but I am excited for the new investments this budget makes in reentry support and in early childhood education, as the, these are two areas that have long deserved greater focus from the city. I'm looking forward to working with all of you and others in my administration and cabinet on these important initiatives. And now I'll turn it over to Interim Commissioner Rivera. Thank you, Chief. And thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Councilors. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present BCYF's 
FY23 budget. Um, it's my honor to be here before you as interim commissioner of BCYF. I've been in this role since October uh, 1st. And like um, Chief Maso, I am also a product of BCYF and uh, BPS. Um, and as he, he's already introduced my colleagues, uh, Eddie McGuire and Barbara Pecci, um, but we're also joined in the gallery by some of our um, directors. Um, we have, oh, let's see, we have Pat McDonough, our um, facilities manager. We have Sandy, our public information manager, and um, Billy Ryan, who is our uh, programming manager. And I hope I didn't forget anyone. But we have um, some of our staff in the gallery. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be reading from my notes so I don't forget anyone and anything. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank Mayor Wu for her support of BCYF. And um, over the last several years prior to being in this role, I was also uh, Chief of uh, Staff in the Health and Human Services uh, Cabinet. So uh, again, no stranger to the Cabinet or to the work of BCYF. Um, See, so just to give you a sense of the, um, the department. Uh, so for those of you that are not familiar with uh, BCYF, uh, Boston Centers for Youth and Families is the largest human service agency. We operate 35 facilities across the city, which includes 19 pools and a beach. 15 of those community centers, or those centers are, are shared spaces in uh, their school-based community centers in BPS buildings. Uh, the buildings are owned and maintained by our sister agency, the Boston Public Schools. Um, you can uh, go to our website, our interactive website, on the homepage to learn more about the facility characteristics in those spaces. We currently have 44,000 members in our system. Uh, there is no fee for membership. We are now um, going into our third year of having uh, no membership or being a uh, universally, universal free membership um, entity. For the past a little over a decade now, we've had this programming framework called ACES. Um, ACES stands for Arts, Community, and Civic Engagement, Education, and Sports, Sports Encompassing Fitness, Recreation, and Health. Um, and essentially, this is the framework we use um, to uh, when we're developing programs across sites to ensure that we have an array of programming, um, quality programming across all of our centers. Um, this ensures not only we provide quality programming, but that it's outcome driven and that we're adapting to meet the specific interests and needs of the individual communities. Okay, at this time, I'd like to highlight some of our accomplishments from FY22. So in FY22, BCYF continued to remain open. We've remained open throughout the pandemic, continuing to serve uh, the community, whether it's through the programming for youth, seniors, um, as well as uh, meal distribution. And we've continued the meal distribution at 30 of our centers. We worked with the Public Facilities Department to complete the um, lead remediation project at the Nazaro Community Center in the North End, and worked with the Public Facilities Department to complete the repair renovations at the BCYF Rosendale Community Center in Rosendale. BCYF Super Teens Program returned full in-person to full in-person programming to provide 250 youth ages 13 and 14 with six weeks of uh, summer programming. And during that time, we had 250 teens that learned crew on the Charles and 250 teens that participated in legal workshops, uh, debate activities. Um, they received a stipend at the end of the program. That's a photo of them there. We also employed 850 teens and young uh, and youth over uh, the course of the summer. Uh, we are the, and that's thanks to the Department of Youth Engagement and Employment. And we are the city department that employs the most youth throughout the summer. We collaborated with the Boston Self-Help Center in an adaptive sports initiative. In addition to wheelchair soccer, vault hockey played in power wheelchairs was introduced at the Boston 
sorry, at the BCYF Tobin Community Center, that's Vault Hockey, which was the first time in the US. Individuals with disabilities with upper lower body uh, mobility can compete in vault hockey. Uh, just a few accomplishments, or uh, rather a few initiatives for next year. Oh, sorry, going, going back to the um, adaptive sports, um, that is an initiative we're certainly looking to expand upon. And if you've not stopped by on Saturdays at the Tobin, you have to stop by. We are thrilled to be partnering with the Boston Self-Help Center on that one. Um, so a few initiatives that we have planned for FY23. Um, we mentioned, or I mentioned the ACES framework, which has been part of BCYF for over a decade. We are looking to revisit that framework and um, reevaluate it and introduce an equity approach. Looking to increase the engagement or community engagement across all of our community centers. The community centers are hubs of, the, hubs of their community and we need to do better at engaging our communities. Um, the pandemic, of course, has taken a toll in terms of uh, families, children, and youth coming into centers and we're still not where we were and we're certainly not doing as um, well as we did last summer. So we need to do uh, better at community engagement, getting out into the communities and re-engaging families and reaching out. One, improve access to um, BCYF swim lessons by creating a curriculum and a tiered system of swim lessons that's implemented at all BCYF pools. We, um, Mayor is commi committed to um, making sure that all kids know how to swim. In order for parents to be able to, at any BCYF pool, no, uh, you know, access classes and you leave one pool and go to the, another pool and you can uh, pick up the curriculum and pick up at whatever level um, you left off. We want to make sure that we have that um, standardized uh, lessons across all of our sites. We want to increase senior programming opportunities across BCYF networks uh, in partnership with Age Strong and community partners. Um, as I mentioned, we have two senior centers but we have an array of senior programming across our centers. We want to strengthen that, build upon that, in partnership with the many senior uh, CBOs and agencies, as well as with the Age Strong. And given a lot of the activity we've seen recently, we want to double down our efforts to work with teens and tweens. Um, we want to increase teen tween leadership program opportunities in our community centers during the school year and throughout the summer months. Um, expand access to technology programming to learners of all levels, new and advanced, by offering a new menu of online and, um, programs and as well as our, com our community centers. Uh, so I'll pause there um, for your questions on the FY23 budget. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share a little bit about our accomplishments as well as a little bit about our department. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think now is probably a good time to get uh, Council Mejia's questions in, and we'll put them on record. Um, I think I'll go ahead and ask her questions, and let me just stop the timer one second. Um, I'll go ahead and ask her questions, and please uh, feel free to answer on record. Um, the first question she has, Council Mejia has, is uh, we've received a number of complaints about pools being closed with little to no notice from BCYF. What is the plan in the future to ensure that any and all changes in programming or access to BCYF spaces are con communicated clearly to the community and with enough advance notice. Okay. So the pools, um, we have, before the pools are closed, we do post them. We post on our website as well as social media. So we try to give as much as advance notice as possible. And um, before, if, if it's depending on what it is, if it's mechanical, we have to immediately close it. 
Uh, so that, you know, is inevitable in terms of how much notice we give. Um, but I'm going to turn it to Eddie to respond to the rest. Yep. <clears throat> when it comes to that reallocation of staff, we have about a 14-day notice. Um, sometimes during emergency situations, it's shorter than that. Um, in light of the most recent pool closing, which would have been the Mildred Ave pool, we try to give at least a week notice um, in order for them to, not only for the staff, but also for the neighborhood as well. Um, ideally, we would be giving at a minimum of a week notice to the community about these situations, as the commissioner has just highlighted. When it comes to mechanical issues, sometimes those things are unforeseen and uh, we have to do it, but staffing has been somewhat of an issue and we're looking forward to making some announcements about the opening of pools uh, in the very near future rather than the closing. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Councilman here, second question is, it seems like the FY23 target for the number of teen visits to BCYF sites is lower than the FY23 projected. Can you please explain why the projected FY23 number is lower than that of FY22. The only thing I can attribute, uh, the FY21, she said, right? She or said that the 23 projection is uh, lower than 22. For teens, in particular. For teens and 22. It seems like the FY23 target for the number of teens visits to BCYF sites is lower than FY22. Thank you, I have to see what page that's on before I can get back to her. Because uh, the 20, I thought it was a 20 that was higher because a lot of that was remote. And so the in-person is really what we want. So that's gonna be you know, lower than remote if we're counting that. So I'll have Do. to get back to her on that. Okay. Um, the next question she has is, one of the stated goals for BCYF is to develop a citywide framework with an equi equity approach for BCYF programs and activities. Can you talk okay, so through? You can send it to me if you find something worth can noting. You, can you talk through how you are going about creating that framework and who you will be partnering with? We don't know at this time. One of the stated challenges was hiring lifeguards for BCYF pools. One of the recommendations you had made in terms of how to fix that problem was by going more, by doing more outreach in high schools and colleges. Can you talk through a little bit about what that outreach looks like and how it has been going so far? That was Councilor Mejia's question. Yep. Um, with respect to recruitment of lifeguards, <clears throat> um, so one of the approaches that we've done uh, specifically is we've lowered the age. So previous accounts over, the, I think, the last years, it was typically lifeguards were hired around 18 years old. We've lowered the lowered that age to 16, which is still in the, still in line with the state regulations and recommendations. But also we've tried different approaches of trying to reach people. I don't know if. You've all seen, but we've shared a video. Uh, it's like a 60 second rail for that to be shared on social media. We've also outreached to community partners, not only YMCA, but DCR to see if there's different avenues to attract different individuals uh, that would like to participate. Um, as everyone might now be aware, there is a national shortage of lifeguards. Uh, it's not just a Commonwealth or a city of Boston issue. And so we're trying a variety of different things, but also taking a look at the structure of the position to see uh, if we can make it more enticing for applicants uh, of all ages. We've, Thank you. No, I was just going to say, we've, um, we're waiving the residency requirement, um, increasing the pay. So we've tried a couple of things to be in co uh, as competitive as the state. And we've also partnered with DCR. So they have, um, you know, applicants that they're not hiring because they have an influx because of, you know, their um, benefits uh, they're sending our way. Um, we also work with um, the, our lifeguards. Some of them in our staff have access to different uh, leagues. 
so they're part of a professional network. And so we're trying different pipelines, not just the colleges. Uh, so it's not yielded as much as we'd like because of, as Eddie mentioned, that it's, this isn't a local, this is a national and international um, crisis we're having. Uh, so it's not yielding as much as we'd like or as quickly as we'd like. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council President Ed Flynn, District 2. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And thank you all, and go Dragons. It's great to hear. Um, so I was looking forward to this hearing. I love community centers. I grew up in community centers, and I do have to mention that my grandfather, Papa Murphy, advocated that the neighborhood had a community center and a school built, which was an empty lot that they were just dumping trash and parking parking lots on. And when the city, back when Kevin White was investing in building schools and community centers, they built the school down in our neighborhood that they named after him, so the Richard J. Murphy School, which then my Auntie Kay and my mom, right when the gym, I don't even know if the floor was dry yet, but they started the first teen center up in the gym. I learned how to swim in the pool, so grew up in community centers and also loved the, um, the value they offer the community, but also the intergenerational. Because my grandmother with Mrs. Burke was in the first senior room center um, at, down there at the Murphy School, which I knew grew across all communities across the city. So they are necessary, and I'm here to support and advocate them for sure. Also, um, as a Boston Public School teacher, for many years I worked in a school which was connected to a community center. So I understand the hoops you have to jump through for these centers that are attached to the school and would love to continue that conversation and um, how we can support you because I know that programming in the buildings that are attached to schools aren't as easy as the standalone. So just wanted to get that on the record. Um, and also wanted to thank you, um, Marta. I know we met with you um, on a call back at the beginning of the year because COVID, um, was hard for all departments across the city, but definitely turned your department upside down, supporting kids and families where schools were closed and trying to really be there for the families and the children across the city. And just wanna thank you for your professionalism for trying to um, balance what was safe, what was good for the children, but and also your employees. So just wanted to shout that out. I appreciated that. So my few questions I have, um, the first is, if you could talk to me a little about the councils that are at each different community center and how that connects to the programming they're able to do. Um, I know Councilor Mejia mentioned this one, but I do want to talk about um, if there's anything more to say about the staffing shortages that I know it's been a struggle for all departments across the country, not just here in Boston. Um, in particular, I know you touched on it already, so I'm happy to hear that um, I knew the restraints because when I reached out to you when the pools were closing, finding out that um, you know the residency, which I'm a fan for, you know, city jobs for city kids, but understanding that you couldn't hire college kids because of the residency and the full-time requirement. So if there's anything more we can do to support on that and to get you know qualified lifeguards and other staff in place, because we know that. It was great to hear that you employ the most youth across the city, and we know that your needs, I don't know, they probably quadruple when the summer comes because of all your summer camps and schools are out, so definitely important. Um, and the lifeguard training. Mom, after myself growing up in the community center, my own children also grew up in community centers and went to the summer camps, and Miss Lisa and Miss Jill down at the Murphy became you know, family to so many still in our community. I know that's true across every neighborhood in the city. Um, and then also we're lifeguards, so knew, know that that training needs to be pushed out and how can we do a better job at, you know, into maybe the schools across the city to make sure kids know that this is an opportunity. And I know that you were lowering the cost or waiving it all together and being more flexible on when you were offering the classes. So if there's anything more you'd wanna talk about that. Two other things, um, one of the big things I'm advocating for here in this new role is the mental health crisis we're going through and had a hearing to discuss and I know we'll continue to talk about it probably for decades 
and knowing that there was already a crisis, but the pandemic has really made it even worse for so many, all, all ages, not just young kids, but is there um, a need now more than ever, I believe there is, to increase the funding at our community centers, making sure we're beefing up that programming, you know, this summer, next summer, that no one's on waiting lists for summer camps, and we're, and I know it then goes hand in hand with the struggle for staffing, but how can we support that way? And my last question would be around the standalone community centers. I know there's a study out, and I've been to some of the community meetings about building one in Dorchester, and is there a need? Do you, I, I've heard from the community and talking to people that there might be a need for two standalone, like, and would we need to make sure we're allocating money in the budget for that? We know Dorchester is the largest neighborhood in the city of Boston, and what we're hearing is where we would put it, maybe there's a need for two. So those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. So Council Murphy, first, I just wanted to um, thank you for sharing your personal story. I, I did not know that connection, so I highly appreciate that. Um, I love to see the lineage uh, that most folks have uh, living in the city to our BCYF centers. So that is really appreciated. Um, I know you, list, you listed a, uh, a few questions, and so I think I'm going to just try to pivot them as best as possible um, in regards to the lifeguards. Um, and what we're doing in regards to the training, I mean, I'm passing to Eddie, and then uh, I'll try to field it from there. Okay, perfect. Yeah, the lifeguard training, so we've held multiple classes this far. We have <clears throat> one scheduled for, I believe it starts this week, and then we'll go into June, and then we have an additional class coming, but we're looking to try to put one on. Typical cost of a lifeguarding class that we is around like $350. And we charge 40 bucks. We also help train uh, the YMCA lifeguards as well as DCR lifeguards in those classes. Um, but when it comes down to if anyone is interested in the class and they are unable to potentially pay that $40, that's not an issue. We use we work with our foundation to provide scholarships as well, another mechanism for recruiting and trying to get individuals in the pool. Um, we have seen an increase um, since we posted for summer jobs, um, about 27 applicants as the last time I checked coming in. We need to see a lot more than that, but we are seeing an uptick in uh, the desire to, to work for um, you know, city pools and things of that kind. Um, overall, when it comes down to recruiting for lifeguards, we try everything we possibly can from social media to word to mouth. We've administrative coordinators identifying you know, young kids that have been in the centers that want to take the next step mm -hmm. to uh, be a part of you know, the BCYF network. Um, so, I mean, anyone you know who knows how to swim and would like to have a, you know, a summer job, please send her our way because uh, we're trying to get them in the pools and trying to bolster our aquatic programming. Um, and once we're able to get the lifeguards, we will rotate right into offering as many classes as possible to learn how to swim. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to mention the, um, so we also provide, uh, most people don't know, we actually provide training for other entities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we, we provide, we have contractual agreements with the uh, Department of Recreation and Conservation in order for them to get lifeguards. Um, as well, YMCA, we're working with them, who is connected to BPS and students, uh, providing scholarships as well as other opportunities to, um, to bring in. But let's see, we're short on time. So the two outstanding questions I just want to put on the record, you can answer later or get back to me, is how the council with the programming and then also the Dorchester, is there a need for two? Yeah. You can So there, I can quickly, there is, uh, yes, the, they are setting a lease for two. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, some familiar faces <laughs> and some not so familiar faces. It's so nice to be here in person to see, meet, talk with you all. Um, so in Alston Brighton, it's, Alston Brighton's the second largest neighborhood in the city. We have a population of about 75,000. We have one BCYF center, which is slated to close next year. Um, uh, I'm just curious, um, do we know, and the pool issue, speaking of swimming, is another critical piece in, in our neighborhood. Do we know how many um, BCYF centers or pools there are per, per Boston planning district? Have you got good, good numbers by district? Um, and then how many, um, centers do we have per capita per district as well? I'm just trying to get my head around 
um, need and distribution, and uh, we're talking about a citywide equity framework. It seems like uh, we have some work to do in Alston Brighton. Um, in in each district, um, how, what what is the expected distance that uh, residents or families would live from from a neighbourhood uh, BCYF centre? Are we do we have sort of a metrics or, or goals that we were, were trying to meet in that in that space. Um, and I just really want to get some idea about what the timeline might be. I know the Jackson Man Community Centre is going to close next year when the Horace Man, the last school on the site is going to close next next summer. Um, and the, the, the community centre is slated to close at that time. Um, the community centre, the schools were supposed to close last year, and now they were they were going to close this year, and now you know we're going, we pushed it off to next year. This has been in the pipeline for a long time, and uh, we haven't really seen much action in terms of getting to it and and working with the neighbour neighbourhood to um, develop a plan. I know uh, Dorchester has a has a process going on, a study. Um, Charlestown has a study. Um, I'd, I'd really like to get some metrics on, on the prioritization of Alston Brighton. I feel this is urgent because we have one centre and, it's, and it is a, a critical piece of our infrastructure. Uh, it has a huge, uh, huge number of programmes that it delivers. We have, um, it's a FEMA emergency centre, it's a cooling and heating centre for especially, very important because Alston's a heat island. Uh, it's a polling place for five precincts. It provides adult education, especially English language classes for our immigrant population at GED, sports and recreation, licensed before and after school programs, summer programs, childcare, and, um, and then some other things. It's a really, really important um, community center in our neighborhood. And it's very distressing for our community to think that next year the doors are going to close and we don't have a any sort of an idea of what, where, where all those services are going to be um, distributed to, wh what we're going to do in the interim. And the other big issue is that the Jackson Man campus is, the, is, a, is, a, is a big campus, but it is really the only piece of city-owned property apart from the public works yard that is available for development. The, the public works yard isn't available for development either because we don't have anywhere to put it if we build on it. So I think this is where it's going to have to happen. You know, we have a siting study. Well, you know, we skipped the siting study. We know there's nowhere else to put it. So we have to really get some urgency into the situation and push uh, to make sure that we have a plan by next summer, that we have a plan for, you know, a solid plan and an action and timeline for how, how we're going to get an, a new community center up and running in, in Austin, Brighton uh, in a very, very, short space of time. And not to cut the corners, because I understand that the current building was built on a short timeline in the, in the 70s in a response to the busing crisis. So um, we have to build a really good community center. And the other issue is I understand there's a lot of tension between shared facilities with BPS, because they're sort of like, they're walk, working on two different timelines. There's a lot of um, um, conflict about shared, shared space and things. So. Um, a standalone community centre that is adjacent to a, an elementary school would be, to give the, the community centre some autonomy would be really helpful as well. But I'd love your thoughts on any and all of this and uh, have to say that the rebuilding of a community centre is a really top priority for our district. Thank you. Oh, well, I um, thank you for the question. And, um, you know, I, I had shared with you we don't have, um, we wouldn't be able to drive, like we don't drive the or push the um, the timeline. It, it is a BPS facility. Um, we also, you know, we're working with public facilities, as you know, on the um, you mentioned the, the siting study, and you know, moving that aside or sort of go, going past that right to to that spot. Um, I, I don't know that that would be, you know, the uh, an option for the process because we can also explore, um, you know private lands or private properties. There's other properties we could look at. Maybe that's not the case. There's none there. <laughs> I can honestly say there's none there, unless we've got 100 million to drop, uh, just to buy I, the land. We don't have it. 
I mean, we have we have the, the the funding is there. It's you know, it's part of the the PFD's process. Um, happy to go back and say no siting study necessary. Go right to design. I, it's not my um, that's not my area of expertise, but I'm happy to make that recommendation and you know get that get that expedited if that's even an option. I do think that you know it's you know it's next. That is the next. Um, uh, Siting study for us, and again, happy to move it forward. How long does a siting study take? Uh, depends on, we've done six months, three months, depends. Yeah. 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 Um, so the, the other, you know, this, the process is holding up other improvements to other, because it's adjacent to the uh, Ringer Park uh, Ringer Park is a, a historic Olmsted Park right next to the community center. And, uh, you know, so no one's passing go because they're all waiting for what's going to happen at the Jackson Man, what's going to happen at the community center. So there's all this sort of pent up. Yeah. I, I get it. Even if I stuck. decided today we're passing, yeah. bypassing yeah. the siting study, yeah. it's a BPS building. Yeah. Community center, BCY would not be able to expedite the process or do anything with the building or the property. Okay. Um, the other uh, question I had was, do you, in, the, in the absence of having a, a, a swimming pool in, in our district, uh, do you have partnerships with D DCR? There's one other, there's, there was two DCR pools, uh, one of them went down on Brook Street, at the bottom of Brook Street was is demolished now. It's it's been, we're going to try the state, we're trying to get state money and, and Representative Moran's working to have that pool rebuilt. But the other one is up in, in Cleveland Circle. Do we have partnerships with DCR to provide um, swimming opportunities, uh, swim classes for BCYF um, teens to learn how to swim in other facilities in the neighborhood? We do have partnership with them actually. So they, we teach them to, we train them. It would, it would just be a matter of coordination with those entities. We're talking to them pretty regularly. And not if it wasn't to be accommodated at those locations, then we would work to make sure that we transport those kids to our own locations in order for them to have the opportunity to swim. So we're always looking for third parties to help with us, but as well as our own entities. So, yeah. Uh, and then access to pools, do we, are we talking to our universities? Because the summer programs, the pools, are, the schools are closed. The universities have pool facilities that we could pretend. We don't have a pool. Mm -hmm. Are we talking to universities about perhaps BCYF pro summer programs being able to use the university pools for a period of time so that these young people can learn how to swim? It's really a critically important skill to have. I have not had uh, any conversation with the universities at this time, but I definitely will look into that and make sure I uh, reconnect with you about the progress of that. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, um, and thank you to the whole team for being here, and especially uh, Commissioner Marta, who's famous in my neck of the woods in Mission Hill, um, and, and also Chief Welcome. We're so thrilled to have you. Um, I, I'm going to put my questions on the record quickly, and then whatever we can get to, great. They're not meant to be gotchas, so if some of them are follow-ups, that's totally fine. Um, so one question I had, um, thrilled to see the proposal to make the Tobin more accessible. Um, I love having the wheelchair hockey, not hockey, um, uh, soccer in my, uh, the hockey's also being explored, but wheelchair soccer, um, you know, live in the Tobin, but obviously it makes the situation vis-a-vis -vis wheelchair access all the worse there. Um, so I know when we had PFD in, I think it was sort of in response to my question, so I'm not sure whether they've actually kicked the tires, but they were sort of thinking about was there a way to connect that to the retaining wall project such that it could move forward faster. So I just would love to know what the timing and plan on that is. It's something that it feels like should have happened yesterday, and I'm so happy that you guys are moving it forward. Um, so just want to stress that. Um, not actually in my district, in Councillor Lara's district, but on, but um, I hear a lot from back of the Hill, Mission Hill constituents about the Henderson, um, and I think there's like a general kind of perception that it's it's not really been invested in and kind of like repositioned amongst BCYF's assets, where the Tobin obviously is sort of like the beating heart of Mission Hill, but the Henderson is a little bit falling between the barrels, and so um, you know some curiosity about what the vision there is and whether there, that's a place where we can. Um, invest more. Um, on the budget front, 
this is, I have a sort of set of expenditure questions which are in the RFI response that you guys sent us. Um, there are quite a number of line items where the vast majority of the money in the line item is neither uh, expended nor encumbered. So for, in for instance, 92% of current charges, $316,000, about 96% of office uh, furniture expenditures, 28.7%. The 87% of the miscellaneous equipment line, 154,000. 80% um, of the auto energy supplies, 40.8. 96% um, of the um, the repairs to buildings and structures, 153.9. 62% um, of transport of persons, 163.7. And then like another 52.6% uh, of the 32.3 thousand for office supplies. And I ask about these because, you know, obviously you guys give us that snapshot in time and we would expect if all else was equal for those items to be about 66% expended and about 33 to 25%. It matters a little bit when you took the snapshot in April. But um, so when I look at that kind of overall, if I norm it against expectation that you're spending evenly, I would say it's about half a million dollars that kind of I would have expected to have been spent by now in the year that hasn't been. Um, so I wondered if you guys could speak at all to that and give the council some sense. And it's again fine if on the detail level this is a follow up, but like which of those are places where it's just lumpy spending and we're spending it all in May, June mm -hmm. versus where are places where you expect the line item to actually come in under budget and kind of what's driving that if so. And then my last question um, is. This is really a longer term follow up and I would love to just identify who the right person in BCYF to kind of um, move forward on this is. Um, in my district, we have the Fenway Community Center, um, which came out of, uh, out of actually development like mitigation um, in the neighborhood and, um, and we're about to have a West End Community Center, which similarly is coming out of the large MGH project. Um, and in both cases, you know, we've really taken that approach, recognizing that it's pretty difficult for BCYF to expand its physical assets um, in, in my part of the city. Um, so we're trying to sort of bring the private dollars to the table. That said, I think it would be good to find ways for both these places to coordinate more with BCYF, especially when there are programs that you guys are trying to roll out everywhere. Like this came up a bit recently. We've had some success with like when we were doing testing sites um, or like vaccine sites at all the BCYF centers to also kind of partner with these private entities. But I would just like to figure out how to make that a little bit more of like a stable relationship. Because obviously what I hear from folks in my, in my district is that they're disappointed that we don't have more public facilities in the district. Um, in that sense, it's, it's similar to Councilor Braden's situation. Um, and so I would love to kind of figure out a little more stably what the halfway house is there, at least in the sense of having like a clear point of contact and a sense of like, oh, we're doing, we're handing this thing out at all these centers. Maybe we could also work with these ones, et cetera. So we'd just love to know who the point person on further conversation about that would be. So those are my questions. And if you have any updates on them right now, that would be great and otherwise. And then I also wanna say that I'm gonna be briefly stepping out. One of my constituents is pinning her granddaughter in the uh, EMS graduation and I said I would stop by, but I am hoping to be back shortly, so. So I was trying to, the point person on anything external? Well, mainly on like, if we wanted to build a little bit more of a stable relationship with these entities. Yeah, like who, who do I sit down with? Okay, Eddie, that's great. All right, you can do that next. And then I don't know if there were any off the top of the head things on the expenditure front or the Tobin or the Henderson. So the Tobin, the ramp was a proposal separate from the retaining wall. Um, <coughs> and I'm not sure on the timeline. Okay. Hoping sooner rather than later, of course. Indeed. Yeah, and I can follow up with PFD. I think they were thinking about whether there was a way to roll it in with the authorization and make it faster. Um, and do you, any initial responses on some of those un, unexpended funds? So the unexpended fund, the only thing I can imagine, if, I'm gonna turn it to Barbara, but because of, we had um, a lot of turnover in finance, there was, you know, there wasn't, we didn't have the staff to be able to procure some of that stuff, but I'll turn it to Barbara. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, <coughs> that's, that's really the, the short answer. <clears throat> we could look specifically at some of those, um, some of the areas that you were talking about specifically, if you wanted to send those, and then we can get back to you on those. Um, but typically with, with that level of turnover, then um, being able to expend some of the contracts, we're a little more delayed in the process. So we're hoping to build up that part of the team, you know, in the, sh in the 
shorter sense, and then we can get back to you on more specifics on the numbers if you like. Great, yeah, I'll send through the chair the specific ones that I read. It's basically all the stuff in your guys' budget that was like way like up in the kind of north of 50% unexpended or unencumbered. And I think it's just compared to other departments, you have a high number of those this year. So I'm trying to understand what of that money is all gonna be spent in a rush in the next two months and what of that money is not being expended this year. So I, I'll follow up through the chair on that. Yeah, we'd love to give you the detail. Thank Great. you, Councilor. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah, thanks so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and apologize for being late this morning. Apologize to the panel for being late as well. I also want to say thank you to the panel for being here and for the work they're doing in the city. Um, my questions, like many of my colleagues, revolve around swimming lessons. This is an issue I've focused on for several years. Um, trying to develop the YMCA and BPS to come to some type of partnership so we could provide swimming lessons to kids in BPS, but especially um, students of color that have not been able to get the same swimming lessons as other, other kids. So I know I've called for a hearing recently as well, I believe with Councilor Lara on, on this critical issue. So what are we doing in terms of providing swimming lessons to all BPS kids, but especially kids of color, um, students of color, students with disabilities, as, as we know a lot of the drownings that happen in and around greater Boston, a high percentage, a high percentage of, of them are Young, young, young men and women um, of color. So it's important that we continue to work on this issue. Just want to see where we're at on that type of initiative. Um, so the first thing that I focused on, having come into this role, is is primarily staffing. In order to us to you know be able to provide the programs and the classes that you're talking about, we have to have. Um, the necessary staffing and ratios. So unfortunately, we've had to make some tough decisions, um, but luckily we're getting into a position where we're gonna start being able to offer more aquatic programming as well as opening more pools. Some of them are facility related, some of the issues are staffing related. Um, but overall, what we have been focusing on is recruitment, and that is so that we can open up every single pool in the city. As you can see there, about seven pools right now that were closed. The Mildred Ave pool is opening tomorrow. We're aiming to hopefully open up the Condon pool within the next few weeks. Um, and once we're able to get those pools open, we're gonna have a much higher uh, chance of getting those classes started and kids in the pools. Some of the things that we're focusing on primarily are areas where we are seeing, or we see upticks in you know, youth violence as well as just the need for individuals to have that. Um, we have had multiple pools closed in areas um, that the demographic is largely the community of color and you know we've made it a priority now to ensure that the new hires that are coming in will be there to staff those pools and the investments necessary for those pools to reopen will also be there. Um, I had a great conversation the other day um, with Madam Chair about starting a the, the Sister Swim program, again, happy to announce that we're able to move uh, two female lifeguards in the Mason pool and have a third one incoming, so we're hoping to have, start that swimming, swimming lessons within the next few weeks as well. Um, but overall, you know, my, my, my main function was to do an overall assessment of what the aquatic situation was, to understand how many lifeguards we would need in order to operate those pools, and now we are working toward getting those types of recruits to get them going. We have had an increase in classes. I think you know, the aquatic situation did get hit uh, pretty heavily when it came down to COVID, uh, just in general, but uh, we're almost there. We have actually reduced our ratios. Our, so the, the ratio is, was typically one to 25, so one lifeguard to 25 um, participants, and now we're operating at one to 20, which is in line with the state, but just so that we're able to, you know, use the resources that are available to us today to try to facilitate as many classes as possible. We have been, like I said earlier on in the hearing, we've been focusing pre pretty heavily on um, re 
lifeguard training, but we do offer uh, swim lessons as well. So uh, very successful swim lessons are going on at the Charlestown pool as well as others. Um, but you know, we're not exactly where we want to be today, and we're hoping that within the next few weeks of getting the, the proper employment uh, rolling that we'd be able to you know, pick up on um, not only the classes, but also making sure that we have open swim and just regular aquatic programming. I've, I've held a hearing on this issue before, mostly it was relating to um, safety, swimming and safety, mm -hmm. and I'm having another hearing with Council Lara on providing kids with access to swimming lessons. Um, so what's, what's happening with the partnership with the YMCA and BPS as it relates to um, swimming lessons for, for students, for BPS students? Yep. Do, do, you, do you have an update on that? Um, so Jeff Mackey has actually been working very closely with YMCA, who is um, one of our facil aquatic facility managers. Um, he's, he has been working closely with them, primarily as YMCA, uh, the Boys and Girls Club and DCR, folk, their primary focus as well um, has been on trying to get the proper amount of lifeguards. And so we've worked with YMCA along with BPS to offer scholarship opportunities. Um, not only for the, the classes, but I know that BPS and YMCA are also working to provide other monetary means to entice um, young individuals into getting into that profession. And then we're working toward getting those individuals at you know local pools to commence the classes um, but, that we see. That, just to be clear, that's an MOU between BPS and the Y. E, e, yeah, that's right. We, we're not in, yeah. So the only extent that we're involved in it is because our aquatics manager um, uh, they actually maintain the pools, the BPS pools. Okay, yeah, that's that's an important MOU. I was I was pushing BPS in the YMCA to to do more on providing swimming lessons for kids, um, and I'm I'm glad they did that. I just wanted to see if there was an update on it in terms of how many numbers or how many students were actually participating in the program, um, how many kids got received swimming lessons? I don't have those numbers, but I can follow up. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was in, well, the, so thank you. So obviously that's one of my top issues is making sure kids receive swimming lessons, especially students of color and students with disabilities. Certainly it's a top priority as well for the, for the chair. We talked about it at, at great, great length too. I was impressed with the program you have for young students at one of the centers for um, soccer, um, wheelchair, wheel, wheelchair soccer for um, students with disabilities. Tell me a little about that program. So that's in partnership with the Boston um, Help Center? The one at the Tobin? Yeah, yeah the that's the one. Exactly. Uh, so we're looking to grow that, but right now it's just at that one location. Okay. They've done um, some demonstration uh, exhibit, what's it called? Uh, exhibition, uh, demonstrations essentially. Um, and that's, that's the hockey and the, the soccer right now. We're limited to that. And over the summertime, are we able to get young kids, um, students with disabilities, are we able to get them out into our parks and playgrounds and BCYF centers, enjoying the outdoor, having, having events for them or having picnics or letting them play some sports and letting them, letting them um, have the opportunity to have some fun as well throughout the summer? What are we, what are we doing for um, young people with um, spe special needs or with, with disabilities? So we're operating Camp Joy for um, how many years now? Many, many years now. Uh, so we have Camp Joy that has a capacity of 100. Um, and uh, so that is a specialized camp for um, kids with special needs, um, not just physical. Mm -hmm. And um, we, of course, have, uh, we had, I think, three sites in the past. This year it'll be at the Oren Burger. Okay, when, could I ask when there are any events coming up for kids with disabilities in, in some of our B, BCYF 
uh, facilities. If you guys could let me know, I'd love to Absolutely. check them out this summertime if possible. Absolutely, Councillor. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, uh, thank you for letting me go over my time. Thank you, uh, thank you. Council President Flynn. Council Rowell, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to the panel, all your great work that you do here in the city of Boston, engaging our uh, youth and our family. Um, do, uh, that one of the community centers is where I had a free swim program, so that's where I learned to swim. That's where my brother learned to swim, um, and my sister as well. So just want to just continue to advocate uh, for free swim program, uh, free swim time uh, here in the city of Boston, because I believe that's how we can create that pipeline of, of lifeguards. Um, my, my one question is just more so on programming. Um, how do we engage the student's voice in programming, knowing that they're going to be the ones who are trying to get into the doors to participate in these programming? Like, how do we get their, in the, what they want to see? Uh, how do we engage their voices and then build the programming around, around their voices? So each center has different ways of doing it. In the past, we had, um, well, pre-COVID, we had a citywide youth council. Um, we haven't activated the youth council um, since COVID, uh, but I intend to. Uh, but that's citywide. Um, but at each site, each site has you know different um, ways that they engage the youth, whether it's through the youth worker or the athletic staff, uh, to to make sure that they're you know, um, giving feedback and, and, you know, being, uh, again, you know, having a say in the activities. The program supervisors at each site, yeah, you know, they're on the ground every single day. Sometimes they'll do electronic surveys. Sometimes they'll have kids in the room. I know High Park right now, uh, community center has a, a survey out just to assess kind of what they would like to see in their computer classes as well as some of the other uh, skill sets um, and programs that they have there. but. Uh, typically, they're always, I mean, they're just in day-to-day -day contact with the students that are coming in, as well as sharing it through different public uh, means, be it social media, to see what type of participation. They assess that with the resources that they have available and then start to develop some programmatic approaches. And from my side on operations, to make sure that staffing and, and those resources are there for that reason. Any, any engagement, like, within the schools or some of those children that <clears throat> um, we don't see coming to the BCYF, like, how do we make sure that their voices are being heard so that we're creating programming around, you know, what they want to see. That's a great um, question. I appreciate it, Counselor. Uh, so as I mentioned in my introduction, what I plan on doing in my first 100 days is not only visiting the sites, uh, each site, but also connecting with community-based organizations and a lot of uh, through the youth development fund, um, the youth serving organizations that we have within there, uh, being able to connect with other youth serving organizations as well to be able to, to assess what the needs are within the community. And so that is part of the process and what it is I intend on doing uh, within the first 100 days. And so uh, being able to coordinate, of course, with our administration and our staff at BCYF is going to be top priority. So uh, that is definitely on the list. All right. I appreciate that. Um, no further questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Counselor. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well. I won't read them. I won't sing the rest. Chocolate. Um, so my questions are mostly around um, equity. I thought that was funny. You didn't? I thought, I thought it was pretty funny. Okay, all right. <laughs> Council Brady, you missed it. Coming to America? No. <laughs> I know where you're going, Madam Chair. Thank you. I, you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> So I see here that you have $4,000 allocated for language access um, or language communications access. Um, is that enough? We, that's actually, I believe, um, double from the year before. So that's for interpreter services. But in addition to that, we have um, an incredible you know, wealth of multilingual, um, bilingual staff. Um, so we don't just rely on that. Okay. Um, Do you want to chime in? I, uh, I believe we exceed it most times. We usually go over our budget. So a lot of the time, I mean, we spent a lot of time in, a, in the next few weeks. You'll see um, we're rolling out, I believe it's all the pool rules. Uh, Sandy Holden actually worked very diligently and all different signage and things of that are. Flyers. Being, flyers are being interpreted as such. But 
Um, <clears throat> we also do rely heavily on staff that have. Do you send out newsletters? We do send out a newsletter. Is that e is that translated? E newsletter. I don't believe it is. Okay. Is that a translator? So it, it's safe to say you need more money yes. for that. Um, do you know the demographics of the students or children that attend BCYF? BCYF throughout the entire network? Yeah. Like uh, just the top three. I don't believe we have a demographic breakdown here, but we can, we can provide. We can provide that to you. Please. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, that I guess would give us more, a better idea. What's, what are the, you know, English language learners or parents of children who do not speak English, right? Um, what about the Grove Hall Center? Um, there's a BCYF, it's already in design and process and planning. What's happening with that? There was, a, there was a center that is in design process. In design? Yeah, it's basically kind of, I guess in the beginning phase, I saw a design for it. I saw a presentation for it. It's a BCYF center to be open in Grove Hall, but they couldn't, the community was going back and forth about elder, adding an elderly center, yep. figuring out was the lot big enough, but then they wanted more. I think you're referencing the siting study. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, she's right. No, so it's, um, that's the, the early stages of identifying a site for a, an additional community center in Dorchester. So there will be at least two in Dorchester. Yeah. And there have been multiple sites, not just a Grove Hall. There are multiple options that are being presented to the mayor. Once the... Um, we want it in <clears throat> Grove Hall. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to the point. We want it in Grove Hall, and we need it in Grove Hall because it's such high you know, risk there. Yeah. And we yeah. want, we, we believe in BCYF. We want preventative measures. Absolutely. So the multiple options, there are pros and cons that will be presented to the mayor. And then once the um, you know top two sites are selected, then they go on to the next uh, phase. Will be the design phase. So what you saw wasn't a de design phase. It's called a fit, actually. That's just um, not so much as design. It's a 3D model to ensure that all of the um, components that the site is adequate oh, to fit all the components at an ideal um, medium size. That would be a medium sized lot, the one across from the community center. Okay. We would like to look at it because we are, there's money in there for design right now. There's a proposed, in yeah. the capital budget, there's a proposed amount for design, so. Because we know there's gonna be a, um, again, at least two sites selected. Okay. Well, we could share that presentation with you after the hearing. Okay, yeah. yeah, no problem. I mean, it's, we're not fixed to location, but in that, you know, toward, going toward Mattapan area, obviously there's a need. Um, what about Smart from the start? Are they still with you guys? Are they still housed in one of your facilities? Yes. Okay. And how's that going? They're a great program. Yes, they are. That's going great. They're staying with you? They have a lease at one of our facilities, the standalone at Johnson, until October. Is it being extended beyond October? We don't know. We believe it might be. Okay. They've sent a letter expressing that they want to remain and that BCYF is trying to exit them out. Is that, is that accurate? We're looking to use the facility. Okay. They wouldn't be displaced. They wouldn't be displaced? They wouldn't be displaced. Oh. We're looking to work with them. Good. Okay, great, because I, I wrote a lot of support and I'm like, is this really happening? And I just wanted to check with you. Um, the facility does need improvements. There's an HVAC system, so there is a yeah. conversation about making sure those investments are made to that facility. And at some point when that investment is made, um, you know, there, there probably will be some time where people will need to leave the building, but that is uh, not finalized yet. Okay, but not displaced. Not okay, great. In your, yeah, and the contract needs to be, <clears throat> sorry. It's an annual the, contract, so we review that yearly anyway. Okay, great. No, no, I, I really uh, believe in them and what they do. I've used them a lot with my foster children and just think that they're an amazing program. Um, I, your top 10 pay, 
let's talk about that. There's only one Latino person or Latina and four black and then there's five white making a total of like, I guess a larger portion of white top paid salary earners. What are, we, what are we doing to change that? That's not equitable according to population served or according to Boston's population. It's your top <clears throat> department salary by race and gender. Mm -hmm. And the majority is male and the majority is um, white. I think reading, that's a really great question. Reading it from your answers. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, you think what it's a great question? question. What yeah, can, what can we do to, in, to, to, is it work for, is it development? You know what I mean? Is it, are we, are we encouraging our staff, current staff now to move up the ladder or what are we doing to make it more equitable? Well, I could speak to what is that. We, what it is that we would like to do. I think, um, you know, future speaking, just in terms of, I think it's a combination of both, uh, looking at uh, the internal um, staff and see, you know, who is available to actually be able to move up the, the ranks, so to speak. Um, just in terms of being able to recruit a diverse staff and population, um, that is, I think, a most priority as well. Um, and something that this administration definitely has been focused on. Uh, to what actually has been done, um, I'll definitely pass the mic over, but yet um, that is something that is a front of mind, and so I do appreciate you elevating that, and that's what I was thanking you for, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. There's about 67% BIPOC population that works for you, so there's plenty of people doing a lot of good work. We, we also want them to, you know, it, it can't just be white top heavy mm -hmm. and just everybody else do the small work, right? Absolutely. Which is not small work, which is the big work. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you get my drift. We're on the same page as this as long as we're working on it. Um, we'll be intensely like looking at creating metrics and uh, uh, some sort of dashboard that, you okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah, shake it off, it's okay. Like we're not gonna laugh. Um, so some sort of dashboard that actually like uses metrics to measure how <coughs> we're working toward closing gaps and stuff like that in the city of Boston. So. Um, we're, we're really interested. That's why this packet hopefully is going to inform us in guiding that. Yeah, for sure. If you, you see that, um, I was trying to find it because I had seen uh, the chart you're talking about. If you see that over time, a long period of time, you see that it has definitely closed and we have, because those top positions are, for instance, the site directors, right? We call them administrative, administrative coordinators. So you have a union environment. People stay in these positions a very long time. So as you know, we're talking about waiting a decade or so for someone to vacate, as those positions are becoming vacant, you know, you have to wait for those opportunities to fill them. Um, so again, over a period of time, you'll see that we are um, diversifying our leadership, but uh, if you hit just tag, take a snapshot in time, you're not going to see quite a difference. Okay, thank you. I mean, I you know, racism is a public health crisis. Everybody's like equity, 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 yay! It's like, all right, well, what does that mean, right? And so we're like, we, the body, the council, is um, really interested in looking at real intentional ways of creating this transformation, of looking at how we as a city can grow. And that's across the board. Mm -hmm. Like, we're going through it, and I, as a chair of Ways and Means, like, we, I filed for an, um, equity in the budget. And we're looking at BPD, at BPS, so it's just, it's not this one department, but everybody. Um, what about your contracts? Three, do you know how many total you have contracts? The, not very many. Okay. The large ones, maybe three, four. Mm -hmm. Or just three or four? Not very many of them. But three, three of them are women-owned. And, but they are in Peabody, Needham, Concord. Which leads me to ask you, which one of them is BIPOC? Of the three women or minority, which one of them is a person of color? Do we know? I don't, I don't, we don't have that in front of us, okay. but we could certainly get yeah. back to you on that. Okay. So I checked, and 
I didn't, I didn't think, I don't think any of them are. Um, so that's, I think that's another area that we can work on. These are the large contracts, like over? They're like, they're larger. They're, um, but out, out of your, all your contracts, you have three that are either women or minority, mm -hmm. and, um, or BIPOC, and those three mm -hmm. appear to be all Peabody, Needham, Concord. When I look them up, they appear to also not be BIPOC. BIPOC. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, I'll wrap it up. I would like to recognize at this time that my counselor um, colleague, Council Flaherty, has joined us. Uh, Council Flaherty, you have eight minutes. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, great to see you, Chief. Congratulations on the new spot. Obviously, uh, our uh, commissioner, Martha, we go back a lot of years, so it's good to see you in that position. And uh, Director uh, uh, McGuire and uh, Director um, Petchy, so it's good to see you all. A couple of just quick questions. Um, I know that uh, I understand uh, my colleagues had asked uh, questions about lifeguard shortages, particularly the swimming pool staffing issues as the heat is now upon us. Um, what are our strategies to increase the recruitment and retention uh, in our aquatics department and how does the this year's budget uh, support those efforts? And that's not only just so the community center pools, like say for example, the Condon School has the indoor pool, yep. but also there's a lot of the outdoor pools uh, that our youth and families depend on across the city. And coming at this as an at-large council representing the entire city, all of our people, and making sure that uh, they have uh, access to these pools and then we have lifeguards on duty nights holidays and weekends uh, okay. particularly during the hot summer days so any strategies that we can talk about and or if they're not reflected in this budget if we can know that now before there's a resubmission if we have to put an ask in uh, then now's the time to to do that so we can obviously get to have the strategies a couple of things we um, mentioned earlier one is an increased pay to be competitive with some of our peers uh, we have also um, submitted for something we did last year, and we uh, don't anticipate a problem, which is for the summer staff waiving the residency requirement uh, for our seasonal lifeguards. Uh, and I'll turn it Eddie for some of the other ones. Yeah, um, we're using every avenue that we can find to try to recruit lifeguards working, like I said, along with uh, the YMCA and DCR in Tranglem, but we're facilitating more classes. Uh, as the commissioner highlighted, we're trying to increase pay, um, remove the residency requirement for summer staff. But also, I mean, I think one of the, the biggest things is just, you know, the day-to-day, -day, just appreciating what they do. I think during the pandemic, the staff, at some point, we're being transferred to a variety of different locations. So we're trying to reestablish trust with our union partners. Um, and right now, we're, you know, we have social media videos that are going out. I post them on every single community board. Luckily, uh, in my previous role, I have access to those. So, um, and as well as just kind of working with uh, staff on site. So we've reduced our, yeah, our standards. I mean, they're all within the state regulations, but uh, typically, you know, we were only hiring around 18-year-old staff. We reduced that to 16 to 18 years old. Uh, our ratios went from 25 to 1 to 20 to 1. Um, we typically had about three lifeguards during the pandemic at each pool. Um, we're now, because of the staffing shortage, have two lifeguards at each pool, uh, well, a minimum of two lifeguards at each pool um, to try to get, you know, these facilities open. We're, we're hoping and we will at some point go back to that three, but uh, for the time being until we can get them. So, I mean, I've, I've worked closely with the administrative coordinators, uh, the program supervisors, all of the individuals that are on the ground every single day working um, with the, uh, you know, individuals. We sent uh, the recruiting materials to the Office of Neighborhood Services and their newsletters and social media access as well as the, you know, the council body. Um, so whatever we can, you know, whatever avenue you know, if you know anyone who's willing to swim and wants to get certified, please let us know. You know, classes are $40 compared to $350, yep. and if you're unable to pay for those, again, we will work to make sure to cover that cost. So. And I would, if I could just interject and make a suggestion, obviously reaching out to our schools, um, yep. uh, you know, obviously both our, our BPS schools, but <coughs> also our network, BC High, I'm a graduate of BC High, we have a great swim team. I would reach out to schools that have swim teams uh, particularly our college and universities, as well as those swim clubs. That could be a good first stop, um, particularly for some high school and college kids that are looking for a, uh, a good summer job, outdoor experience, whether it's uh, you know 
uh, at the outdoor pools. Talk, can we just talk a little bit about the Street Safe grant? Uh, what community centers are uh, utilizing the funding from this grant, and how are those decisions be made as to which sites get the the uh, Street Safe grants? We learned about the Street Safe grants from uh, Boston Police Department uh, the other day. Um, we can come back on it at some point. They have these street state grants that they're supposed to be partnering and working with uh, BCYF on. So, okay. That's his way. but from the look of perplexion, uh, okay. I'll embargo that question and see if we can maybe <laughs> talk about that at some point. And for then clar for clarity, they brought this up. Yeah. They, they, the BPD brought this up and had you listed BCYF as one as of the partner. flag as a partner. Yeah, the SSYI grants. Yep. Yeah. So at BCYF, the, um, we use it to support all our girls programming which is citywide. All the girls programs, you all said? All the girls programs, okay. yeah. Citywide, so all the community centers have access to the grants, great. And then from the capital standpoint, uh, as a citywide council, as I referenced, every neighborhood wants a brand new mm -hmm. bells and whistles uh, community center. Uh, I hear from residents all the time, particularly Grove Hall. Uh, they've been asking uh, for a standalone mm -hmm. center for a long time. Um, so can you please provide an update in whether or not that's the possibility to site a facility there, but also who's in line over the next several years uh, on the capital side to uh, very much like the uh, yeah, very much like the L Street bathhouse. And then maybe just a quick recap as to are we still targeting sort of the first uh, beginning of July for an opening date or is that I want to get a sense to uh, we're, we're trying to Council Flynn and I are trying to manage expectations um, as that work progresses. It looks beautiful. Uh, it's probably one of the best. Uh, it's the most heavily traveled and traversed and used community center in the city. It's been offline now for a couple of years. So we constantly get calls from everywhere uh, asking when it's going to be done. So a quick snapshot on when that will be completed and then the broader question about the Grove Hall site as well as who's in the pecking order for uh, for upgrades. And uh, I could speak to being a son of South Boston as well, uh, to the, L the Curley Community Center. Uh, we're estimating that the date of completion for work internally would be toward the end of July and that is what we uh, receive from DPW or is it? Uh, no, Department of Public Facilities, um, and we're ex anticipating, you know, with the ordering of the amount of equipment and furniture that we'd probably see an opening toward more likely in September, okay. later in September to, to open it up. There are also a variety of things that, you know, as a community we need to discuss as well as an agency with respect to the beach and um, some of the condition that it currently is in as well as some of the walls over there, uh, okay. but the internal facility is coming, I mean, it's it's huge and it's it's coming along. It's looking very good, but uh, just the logistics from supply chain to uh, making sure you know the bids and things are go through appropriately. But they are in the process right now. I believe it's either this Wednesday or it was last Wednesday where they had um, some organizations that would you know apply for the bids to equip the location to walk through the facility to see if it was there. Great. So we're in route. Very good. And then if Council Flynn and I could be kept abreast in terms of whatever uh, types of equipment's going in there and. Yes, contract we, piece of that would that be great <coughs> we Grove have adaptive hall. equipment also being a part of that as well okay. so. and then Grove Hall other areas and I'll throw one in for my colleague Councillor Braden when her when she's going to get a, uh, a new facility over her area but where are we with the Grove Hall opportunity to site a standalone facility so there we have um, Grove Hall specifically so the Dorchester area there was a siting study that was done that they're just wrapping up we're just wrapping up with um, PFD and the consultant uh, UTO and a number of sites are being um, presented with pros and cons. Um, there is a large uh, effort to advocate for a site in or around Grove Hall, um, directly across from the um, current Grove Hall Senior Center. That one of the uh, locations is that site there. Okay. Is that 4048, so like that. That's one of the locations. But those sites are being presented with the pros and cons. Um, there are going to be at least two selected for Dorchester, being the largest neighborhood in Boston. Uh, then those will go on to the next stage, which is the uh, design phase. Okay. And then you know, design phase will go um, into the budget phase. Right. They've been at it a long time. I was in the DA's office when they had the bubble and worked closely with Sister Virginia and uh, Minister Don and also with uh, Lisa Holmes, who was a community service officer, I believe, at the time. So long overdue if we can get the folks in Grove Hall, uh, much deserved. Uh, state-of-the-art community center. I think it'll make a big difference uh, for that community. So, very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Um, I'd like to turn to uh, public testimony. Uh, we have John Provenzano uh, signed up. John, can you please join us?
either of the microphones, where, did you have other people, yeah? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to the councilors being here and especially the guests. Um, my name is John Provenzano. I come from South Boston, long, lifelong resident. Welcome to my world, the L Street bathhouse. Um, I could go on and on about all of the things that come out of that place for everyone in the city. And I could go back to when uh, I was seven years old from then on. Um, the people that have come out of there and the people that have helped children along the way, including my friend down at the, uh, down there, Mr. Flynn, I watched them grow up down there. Uh, one time, and this is, how, this is how great this place is, and I, and I stress this for everybody, is that it doesn't matter what color you are, where you come from, or whatever. I've sat on that beach with doctors, lawyers from Brookline, from, they come from all over to go to this place, and so I'm really proud of you people and what you do. And you naturally, in my business too, we used to get a lot of criticism in my union uh, as an officer, but I appreciate everything you can do for every part of the city. But selfishly, I just want to tell you a couple of things about the L Street Bathhouse, the Curly Recreation Center. Um, whether it's swimming, whether it's uh, uh, being, trying to be an athlete, whether you want to learn how to read, whether you want to learn how to use a computer, everything that you could think of comes out of this place, and it's for everybody. Nobody is discriminated against. Everybody can come there. Um, I, I, I hear from the chair many times about inequities as far as color or whatever, but it's, it, I, I, we have to put that aside. We really have to, with no, no uh, criticism, but we just have to get to work with getting kids off the street, and all we have to do is look at what's going on in this in the city as far as the, the, the kids not having things to do and getting in trouble. Places like the L Street Bathhouse. I'm gonna give you three or four names in my lifetime, if you don't mind, that have come out of the L Street Bathhouse as kids. One of them was Bob Nichols. He ended up playing for the Boston Patriots. He got most of his most of his uh, uh, experience has come out of the L Street bathhouse in the park. Uh, I'm going to save the special one for last, but uh, Freddie Ahern ended up playing for the National Hockey League. What a hero. This guy helped more kids coming through the streets, keeping them off the streets, teaching them something simple like that. And it's just, it just does my heart. I stayed in South Boston because I wanted my kids to, to know their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles, their cousins, and they have to stay there. Can I go on another, one more minute? You don't mind, do you? I don't. I like you. <laughs> You're good with that, Bell. I watch all the, all the hearings on TV because I don't have too much, uh, I don't have a big television uh, celebrity of things. I got basic TV, but this is the, this is the most, Welcome to my world again. I, I, I consider you my political family. I really do each and every one of you. And anything I can do to help get another program going, all they have to do is call me. This guy has my number. This fellow over there has my number. Um, the wise guy over in the corner, Frank Baker, has my number. I'm getting to know uh, me here. And I just, maybe because I talk too much, I enjoy her because we get into conversation, but it's, it's things to do in the neighborhood, whether it's Dorchester, South Boston, wherever. But uh, so that this, if I could just read those names off, it's, uh, you know, we had uh, Freddie Hearn with the hockey. Uh, the world's best racquetball player came out of the L Street bathhouse. The world's best, around, all, traveled all over the world, so proud of it. If you go down to Fort Lauderdale and you go to the Swimmers Hall of Fame, you'll see stuff up in those walls of people that came out of the L Street bath, the Curly Recreation Center, whichever you know, name you want to use, it's down there. This place is just amazing. And 
after I retired, I got to work. Freddie asked me. I was sitting on the beach, and Freddie Hearn asked me to, if I wanted. He said, "I keep seeing you cleaning up the beach and stuff." He said, "I need somebody for a couple of days a week if you want to do some part-time work." And I said, "Sure." I went down there. It was the people that come in, and they would just. They appreciate this place so much. And now that it's closed, I mean, I'm dealing with some guys. I have to get them some uh, psychological help, you know, just waiting to get back there. But it's, it's open to everybody. And I, I really appreciate what you're doing now and what you're going to do in the future. If I could just make, and this is going to save the city some money, maybe, Madam Chair, you can take care of this because you are direct and you know how to get things done. Um, the tower, the clock tower, that's on the building, which is badly in need of some repair. When we had the meetings before the COVID, I had asked the group that was in charge of, of doing the whole budget and what was going to be, you know, spent down there. If anybody wants to get a hold, and I asked them at the time, whoever was in charge, get a hold of Everson. I worked there for 30 years when it was the Edison, whatever. But I, we have contacts that would donate doing that tower over. It's a clock tower. So anywhere in the, around, you can, whether you're in the water or up on L Street or down on the beach or whatever, you know, you have the clock tower. They'll, they will donate to, to refurbish that. And whatever money is saved, if you have an estimate on that, a budget on what's going to be done with the tower, Take that money and put it into another program, whether it's over in Grove Hall or wherever, you know, wherever you can use the money, whether it's in uh, Brighton, which I know you need help over there. You know, Brighton's forgotten a lot of times. The only thing that we could do for Brighton is South Boston High used to beat them every year in, in, <laughs> in football. But it's just another good part of the town. So thank you for that. Uh, if I could just add one more name. <sighs> Excuse me. One of my dearest friends, who was a city councilor, a state rep, the Boston mayor, and also an ambassador, grew up at the L Street bathhouse, just like my friend over there, Mr. Flaherty did, and my friend over there, Mr. Flynn. Just keep it going. Everything we could do to help, anything you can do to help, you just, they have my number. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, I knew this was gonna happen, but no one else wanted to speak, so I figured I took a couple of minutes from a couple of other people, but that's okay. Thank you so much, and I'm proud of all of you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Uh, Provenzano, thank you um, for your testimony. Um, and I, I feel I do need to respond. Um, the sentiment that you share about forgetting about race and the equity stuff and all that race stuff is, I, I receive it as, as uh, though it's coming from a good place. And I think it's a sentiment that naturally we innately all want. And our intentions are to eventually get to a point where we can use some sort of telepathic way of communicating and not needing representation of race so that we can trust one another as human beings to represent the children served in the proper way or to understand their culture or to speak their language or to meet their needs. The other reason why it's important to hire in diversity and to build equity in the managerial level it's because the city is doing a good job with lots of good people in moving toward this utopia you speak of or that you want. And I think that in my words, I'm sharing the same sentiment. However, historically, it's been systemically racist. That is a reality that we all are not proud of and we don't like. In order for us to change and intentionally continue to grow as a city, we have to talk about these hard things. We have to have hard conversations and say, hey, 
where are we, are we hiring, are we paying people of color? Are we employing people so that they can go back home, they can have middle class wages so that they can feed their family, so that we can then perpetuate that in social determinants of health that does not perpetuate violence and hard conditions in communities of color. It's important that we think this way about inclusion. And so I thank you for your good intentions and your utopic ideology. Um, we're not there yet, and I hope one day we can be. Thank you. If I could just oh, sure. One second. Go back to the 80s, and did you ever hear of Mel King? Yes. Mel King ran for mayor mm -hmm. against my neighbor, which was Ray Flynn. I sat with Mel King on the beaches of South Boston to discuss the problems, and I let him know right away that where my vote was going. What a gentleman. And he had visions for the city that since then has progressed, slowly progressed. And I'm really proud of that. So if I'm not a great speaker or whatever. I'm not a real educated speaker. But, but a poetic one. I could, hmm? But a poetic one. I appreciate you. Well, that's, I just want to put that on the records because I remember that like it was yesterday sitting in the audience with my friend Bobby Nichols and Mel King was up there winking down at me, knowing that I wasn't voting for him, but he got his point across. And I went to all the debates with Ray and, and, and uh, Mel King back then. And it was just, it was great. So I know, I know what you're saying. It's frustrating. Everything is just takes a little bit at a time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. As long as we don't hate the person holding those positions that we just hate the behavior. As long as we only hold people accountable for the patterns and the behaviors and don't take it personal. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, we've enjoyed, we've enjoyed you. We appreciate you. We're going to move on to our second round. Um, Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, Thank you, this is a good hearing. Um, the, um, the issue I wanted to check on was just in terms of youth workers that are assigned to help with problem youth. I know we, we had the question about the street safe grants and the BPD. Um, I, I'm curious to know more about that. I know, and Barbara's familiar, we had a uh, right, at the, right just as COVID was breaking in 2020, we had a, a series of incidents that really raised alarm bells in our community and our BHA housing uh, facilities at Commonwealth and Faneuil. Our kids were getting into trouble and uh, we managed to get funding from the state through um, the good um, action and advocacy of our s state senator, Will Brownsberger. Uh, so we got some money and we needed, we were going to hire youth workers and, and we really, um, BCYF, I'm, I don't, it's not a question of blame, but right in the middle of that crisis, you were dealing with COVID and facilities closing and all the rest of it, but we were scrambling. We had money, but we weren't able to, uh, BCYF didn't have the capacity to pull together um, to utilize those funds. So we ended up, thankfully, we, we, we were able to get youth workers and they're being utilized under the management of our community, see the Alston Brighton Community Development Corporation, which is outside their sort of usual bailiwick. I was really wondering in terms of right across the city, how, how are we working um, to be, have a nimble response to the needs of our community? You know, just as the gentleman said, sometimes Alston Brighton's forgotten about, we forget that we have kids who get into trouble in Alston Brighton and that they need support. Um, so, you know, just in terms of we're, we're going to get more money, we're, we're getting, we're hoping to get that, that, that more funding in this, this year from, from the state to, to fund those youth workers. But it's just like this sort of bubble gum and string approach to trying to put together services and, and, and then having a, a steady, predictable funding stream that we can 
you know, hire people and have a plan going forward. It's, it's really something that we need. And uh, I'd just love to have your thoughts on that. The other question I had was with regard to Wi-Fi access uh, at our BCYF centres. I, I understand there's some issues that uh, not every um, BCYF, uh, I'd just like an update on what the Wi-Fi access, because digital access and digital equity is really important across the city. Those two questions. Um, I'll start with the Wi-Fi. So we have, uh, the Wi-Fi still varies, right? So everyone has a Wi-Fi, but the quality of it still varies. In some of our facilities, depending on, um, I'll give an example, I was at the Mildred and they have Wi-Fi, but depending on what room you're in, these walls, these cement walls in uh, some of our school buildings actually makes it difficult to get like a really good, solid, um, you know, connection. Uh, so that makes it so that it varies building to building. Um, but all of the buildings have Wi-Fi access, um, thanks to our partnership with um, Comcast. Um, so I hope that answers that question. And moving forward, we, we want to continue working with Comcast, or um, to my knowledge, they want to continue working with us. And we also want to make sure that we have the infrastructure, right? Not just reliant on our partnerships, but we have the infrastructure to support the technology and the needs at the sites. Um, with regards to being nimble and responsive to the community needs, one of the things that I, one of the initiatives that I mentioned was this, this needs assessment, right? And that needs assessment goes beyond just the site. It's a couple of years ago that the centers did, um, my predecessor embarked on a, a strategic plan. And that strategic plan, um, they started to, the, the department started to work on some of those and move some of that work forward. Uh, and then as I came on, there was a pause. Um, I think that we need to take a moment to pause to do that needs assessment and do, do a deeper dive. Some of that work will continue. Some of it is around improving the hiring processes. Uh, but some of it really requires a deeper dive. And we do need to take um, a broader approach to the work, and that includes that work outside of our own buildings, right? How are we engaging the community? And when we do this needs assessment, that's, that's the work that will come from, uh, that will be elevated, is the work outside of our building has to include the work with our community-based organizations, with BHA, um, you know, recently I've been in conversations with Kate Bennett around our summer work. How are we working in partnership with, um, you know, her staff, particularly around the sites that are either in or near housing developments? Yeah. So all of those coordinated efforts, uh, again, with this needs assessment, like where are the gaps? How is the work happening consistently coordinated and strategically across our departments and across um, our network in each and every neighborhood? that our community centers are located. So, and, and, and get outside the walls, especially if we don't have any walls for a few years. <laughs> well, I think, I really believe that when, I mean, our mayor was said, get City Hall out of City Hall, it doesn't just mean this City Hall, it also means the, you know, our community centers. For this yeah. City Hall, community centers is Little City Hall, but sometimes our community centers can also be the constraint. So we do need to get out of our own you know, buildings and step into the community and uh, again re engage. Yeah. Um, going back to the timeline again, I just looked at the timeline for K um, Charlestown and where else? else um, Dorchester, the timeline of six and a half years. Um, the land acquisition thing in the middle of it, if necessary, is like 12 months. Um, I, I can't emphasize how strongly I feel about expediting the process for Jackson Man. Uh, we have a huge need and mm -hmm. I don't think we can afford to not have a, a, a well-functioning community centre for six and a half years while we wait to build something new. So again, I think that, that's where a lot of creativity needs to come in about how we how we're going to manage services and deliver and keep, keep engaging our youth and, and our elders and everyone else in the meantime. But um, it's a huge opportunity, I hope, I hope we can all work together to make it work. I know, I know you folks are, uh, have got a lot on your plate, but Austin Brighton, this is, this is a big priority. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Brady. Councilor <coughs> Council Flaherty. I just have one uh, follow-up, and it was based on um, my comment about reaching out to the college and universities with respect to helping us um, with the lifeguard issue. What, if any, partnerships do we have with some of those institutions to help leverage assets uh, for us citywide? And that could be, you know, the, you know for example, the, the, the pool at Boston University. Yep. If that's open in the summer, it's, I assume it's staffed. Can we direct folks over there? Or the fields um, year round, not just obviously the, the baseball diamonds and uh, the soccer fields, et cetera, the softball fields, anything where, you know, where uh, we may have a center that may be uh, in need of repair or is in the queue, but things kind of all aren't fully functioning. Can we reach out and partner with someone kind of under that, the pilot, the payment in lieu of taxes agreement? Mm -hmm. Can we get some in kind and or particularly for the summer months, um, you know, to provide some more options for, for folks in the neighborhoods? Um, Council Breeden already pressured me on this. I will be reaching out to our colleagues at those universities to see if we could build those types of partnerships, expect not only for aquatics, but you know, in general to make sure that they're working hand in hand with us. I have yet to have those conversations, but luckily I, I do have contacts at those locations and they'll be getting a phone call from me shortly after this hearing. Right. And then also just a budget item here, as an at-large council here from parents and grandparents and community members uh, sort of looking for quality childcare uh, before and after school. And uh, I would like to see a sort of, I guess, a bigger uh, increase um, in that budget. I didn't see it in this book here, but um, I know that the budget amount for childcare and um, so before and after school programs is 2.7 and some change, uh, which was a slight decrease from last year at a time as we're sort of coming out of COVID and people trying to get their feet underneath them and get back to work. Um, the need, the demand uh, for um, for quality child care and before and after school programs probably has never been greater. And I'm, I'm seeing a decrease here, um, not necessarily a function of this panel's input, but I would think that that number would be, would be higher. So if you can just explain the decrease and then maybe in a resubmission, we can address some of those critical needs of families across the city. Yeah, that so very much, particularly as we head into the summer months, increasing um, you know those uh, those daycare options, the out of school as I call them for the summer months, uh, out of school programs, things like that. But yeah, I was kind of surprised to see a decrease um, at a time when we have we have cash available uh, through APA, and we're also again coming out of a pandemic. Um, we're seeing it in the schools. I mean, just this academic year alone, there's been uh, close to 2,000 incidents of of disruption, of violence, of bullying, et cetera. So uh, if this is, uh, COVID's had an impact on anyone, it's obviously, it's impacted our our school children probably more than anybody. And I would just think that this would be a year would throw a bigger shoulder into making sure that those services are available. And I saw a decrease that concerns me. Yep. So that is actually the City Hall Child Care. It's the only license we carry. Um, all the other child care, after school programs, anything else that's in our centers will not be in our budget because that's either supported by the foundation or by the um, our partnership through the local site councils. So the so the, the the line item here that shows a decrease is for the facility for exactly the, the one here. here, and but it's not it doesn't incorporate no. any other um, programs and and then those other programs have you seen an increase? Those will yeah. Okay. Those will support. Um, we'd have to so for instance the. Foundation with BCYF, mm -hmm. that's, that will be, uh, we anticipate that will stay the same, the support of our, you know, board and volunteers and um, uh, we have, I think it's a 1.5 or 1.2 operating budget. And so, you know, the monies that they bring in supports our programs and those are all out of school time, summer programming. Okay, great. And then citywide, the uh, community center membership, if you will, what, what, what is that number? Uh, well, we have 44,000 44, in our database. And those are folks that come in to, whether it's the Tobin Center, any center they would come in. Anytime they come in, it could be they came in for, for a, right. uh, you know, pick up game, right. open gym, or something, you know, uh, consistent, a class. Gotcha. Something tells me that that number would, seems like would be a little low, you know. It seems like 44,000 people use the L, if you listen to Mr. Provenzano. <laughs> But it just seems like, you know, well, it's the two, I mean, just a number of community centers, they're just, they're always busy. You guys know it, you're, you're out there, Martha, you're, you're on the front lines, you just see the volume of kids, youth and families that are being dropped off or picked up, uh, 
and there's events that are happening. It just seems that for a city our size, that that sort of 44,000 membership number, for me, seems like it's on the low side. But, um, you know, so that's uh, just, just that, that number struck me. But, and again, I appreciate the work that you're doing, and obviously the, the team here, um, from Jose right down to um, to Eddie and to, to Barbara, and, uh, and best of luck moving forward. Look forward to continuing to support. You guys do great work. Um, oftentimes gets doesn't get the notice that uh, maybe some of your other sort of department counterparts get uh, with respect to their budget, but the value that you guys add and the difference that you're making in our communities and the lives of children and families is tremendous. Uh, we're all been probably arguably products of coming through BCYF uh, community centers was what it was called back in my day. Um, and I served obviously on the Tiny Community Council, uh, again, advocating for resources for the community centers in the neighborhood uh, when I get started. So it's, um, so I appreciate the work and attention to detail and it's a passion for all of you to make a difference in people's lives. So I want that noted. And so good <coughs> to see you guys. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilor Flaherty. Um, I'm interested in your programming. Um, I, I noticed that, you know, I, I, I looked at your presentation. I listened to you today talk about what you provide and also your initiatives for FY23. And it would seem that, you know, in, in there are there, almost like you need more programming, right? So where do you think you need more resources to better serve the, um, the youth at NBCYF. So as I was uh, saying to uh, Council Flaherty, our programming dollars come from the, um, our work with our, the foundation. So that's where our program, you won't see it in our budget, although in the last fiscal, last two fiscal cycles, there have been um, dollars allocated to support programming, but it doesn't say explicitly programming. So there's um, the special appropriations. Sorry, I wasn't asking where the money oh. should come from, but where in terms of the areas of program, that was, sorry. Um, in terms of programs, where, which programs do you think you could increase? What areas in terms of programming do you think you need more resources? Okay. Um, Maddie's going to say aquatics. I was going to say aquatics, yeah. <laughs> so okay. Definitely yeah, aquatic important. programming. Um, <laughs> I mean, in general, would definitely be something that we'd want to see increase. But I mean, with all the lists of the programs that we, we facilitate now, um, I'm not, not going to ask, I guess, for more resources. I think there's just a lot of talented individuals within BCYF that have a variety of ideas and, and things of that kind that need some sort of investment. So, general. I feel like a parent being asked to pick from, you know, amongst their children, is, mm, yeah. is it senior programming, is it, you know, the, the aquatics or athletics or girls programming, gender specific, um, it's tough. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I mean, Council Anderson, if you want to give us money across the board to support all our programming, we're happy to accept it <laughs> as a resource. <laughs> of course. Um, I guess I'm wondering, in terms, so you have the academics, you know, you you do support children with homework? Yeah, across the, um, typically out of school time has a component of that. And do you actually support teenagers with homework or do they have allocated spaces where they are, they can go and do homework or are there actually tutors there for, to, t to help teenagers? So it depends on the program. So, so centrally we don't operate a program that says this is that, you know, uh, that has a prescriptive um, at least I can't think of any of our centrally, uh, we have central programs, um, I can't think of any that has that prescriptive uh, curriculum, but across the 30, you know, five community centers, uh, yes, there are programs that help teens with, with homework. Have you been able to do an assessment to understand which facility or which location or program actually is doing that? Yeah, we have a chart that has the different aspects. Of which ones offer what. And then, can I have that for my record? Can you submit that? Sure. Thank you. And then, um, so, I, I did a study once on after school programs for, for teenagers, and then filed this week on how to work between colleges and high schools, creating some sort of partnership. 
um, maybe colleges want to give up their money and pay their low-income college students to tutor, and maybe we're giving students a stipend to incentivize them, especially at-risk students, to get the tutoring. I'm wondering, that conversation is going to go to a hearing, probably education committee. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, because I, I realize that teenagers actually don't have strong academic supports in Boston. This is what I found out. And that unless you had money to pay for the tutoring, and other, like, other than like the school thing where they pay teachers to stay after school in, in libraries, and that sort of like phased out as well. Like there's not that much of that. So teenagers essentially, especially black and brown teenagers in condensely populated areas do not have homework help. Mm -hmm. um, and so overall, I know that BCYF is trying to do that. And I, that's why I was asking you, did you feel that that's an area of need in terms of funding? Um, and then could, could, could that program that I'm suggesting for counselors to discuss live in BCYF, where college students are tutoring high school students, and it could be remote, mm -hmm. but there would be a platform that where they can actually go on computers and create this partnership. And I'm looking, hopefully, maybe it's um, a way of colleges giving back with, through the pilot program, right? Yeah. They're paying their college kids to have a job to tutor high schoolers, mm -hmm. and hopefully we're incentivizing high schoolers to attend um, and that I'll invite you, hopefully, so we can discuss more. I'm interested also in more of holistic programs, not necessarily going too much into, because I know that I'm also tired of hearing mental health. Like, it's almost, it's not your responsibility to house all of these different programs, mm -hmm. but that if we as a city are doing a good job in cre creating this collaboration, that every center has a holistic perspective and is actually connected to the services that are needed. And so I would love to further this conversation beyond budget in looking at your assessments, what the needs are, to really intentionally talk about how is BCYF equipping our children in Boston for academic success or for homeschool connection. Because the schools talk a lot about closing achievement gap and how homeschool mm -hmm. connection is a problem and there's a platform where students get dropped off, but where is the responsibility, one, on the parent, or how are we making, ensuring that parents have the tool to equip them to also support BCYF staff as well as support teachers in their child's academic progress, right, or journey. And so I think that that level of connecting and looking at you know, strategic planning, how are we looking at the framework? How are we looking at the curriculums and connecting it to home, connecting it to mental health providers, as well as obviously really, really implementing home or academic supports after school in helping parents structuring their out of school time, their children's out of school time. I think it's super important and I think that the city needs to do something to partner with BCYF and begin to really look at this in an intentional way. Please uh, respond if you have any feedback or comments. No, I'd be interested in exploring more. Okay. Well, great. Council, Council can I just say, I, I think historically we've always, you know, when you're moving into teen programming, then we've gone into um, some of our teen programs doing homework help or, not homework help, but um, looking Employment. into uh, employment or college readiness, getting ready for interns because, you know, teenagers become a, a little more autonomous in their in their needs and expressing their needs. So but I think this would be a very interesting conversation yeah. for sure. Thank you. I mean, I think when we, when I heard Council Flaherty talking about at-risk youth and how we're engaging, and BPD did mention you as a partner. Um, and then it was a very small amount too. It wasn't a lot of money. Um, and then my thing is, if we're putting a lot of money in criminal justice, if, if a reform means that we're looking at, again, preventative measures, BCYF is it, right? And BCYF really should be like, we should be spending so much more money in BCYF than we do anything else. Because that's, that's the first hit, 
right? Um, and then we should be spending money in bringing those parents in. See, I believe that it's a balance. It's bringing City Hall to out, out of the city or out of City Hall, but it's also bringing parents and constituents in City Hall, whether that's remotely or figuratively, but that everyone has access in a way that I'm empowered enough to understand how to navigate these resources, that I'm holding myself accountable to partnering with you to take care of my child, right? So I put the responsibility on the parents, but I put the responsibility on the city to ensuring that we are also equipping parents with those tools and making, building, bridging those connections, right? Um, and I'm, so I'm, I'm extremely interested um, in youth development overall, and I know that you are, um, and I look forward to our continued partnership. I thank you so much for your time, and Council Braden, would you like to make any closing remarks before we go? No, I just, um, just point, Madam. Madam Chair, um, just to appreciate all the great work BCYF has done over many, many years. Um, it seems we're in this moment where um, evaluating how we use our resources and targeting them and being creative and developing partnerships with our many institutions like our universities and other nonprofits so that we can deliver the best possible service and really, re really, really go after raising up our youth and having them be well prepared to enter the workforce or go to college or just to be really productive and engaged citizens going forward. So. Uh, I look forward to the work ahead, and um, I will be dogging you about the Jackson Man Community Centre, um, but um, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Thank you Madam Council. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Council Braden. And the last thing I'll say is, um, obviously, cultural competency in terms of your facilities, way more money to beautifying your facilities, way more money in just equipment and all of that stuff and programming and building up your buildings, period. But these bland white walls, oh my God, I can't do it. Like, we need to create a grant opportunity to activate art, <laughs> visual or other, in your facilities as an effort to creating cultural competency or welcoming more welcoming environments. And I know that your staff and yourselves are probably tapping into your pockets just like teachers and spending out so you can get creative in these ways, right? Um, because again, I've done a lot of work with BCYF, I've done a lot of work with schools, and understand youth, children are my, is my life. And I feel like um, we, we, just have to, we just have to put our money where our mouth is and um, be more intentional about the spaces that our children are in, but also taking care of our staff members, I believe that everyone in your facilities deserve more money. I don't think they get paid enough. Um, and I thank them from the janitor to the tutors to the counselors to the coordinators, case managers. I thank every single one of your staff people. I just think that your people that take care of children are angels and I, I'm indebted to you. And, I, and I, um, I look forward to working with you to making some good changes. Councilor Murphy, we were wrapping up. That was my closing statement, but I would love to hear from you if you have any comments. Thank you. Um, sorry I had to step out, but I went across the hall to the EMS graduation, which was wonderful. Anytime we see new city employees coming on board, I know when I left we were talking about staffing shortages, and I'll be watching the rest of the tape, but we'll be in touch for sure in supporting everything we can do to make sure our BCYF centers are up and running and to the fullest capacity and whatever you need to support that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>